I'm glad there's not a real fire up here. This is the one time of year in Seattle when you don't want one. <laughs> so, Selena, you launched Evite right out of college. You worked at bigger technology companies for many years after that, and now you're getting back in it with a new startup. So I want to ask you one of my favorite questions for entrepreneurs, which is, what were the biggest mistakes you made the first time around? And what lessons did you take from them that you might be applying now? I mean, the list of mistakes is always longer than the list of stuff you did right in a startup, so <laughs> I won't go through the full list. But, um, but there were many things. When we, I was doing Evite for some context. We were just graduating from college, so it was my co-founder and I. And we actually had about three different products we had developed at the time and didn't really know which one had any business value. Um, as Glenn and other people know, I'm very, very clumsy. And one of the things I did was literally trip over the server that was underneath our desk that was evite.com. And that was like, you know, and, and we were, it was like we were still just graduated. And, um, and suddenly our phone rang. And... This guy said, what happened to Evite? And we're like, oh, well, we'll plug it back in. Give us a second. <laughs> so, we, you know, we plug it back in, and we run the query on the database. And I was like, Al, Al, people are using this thing. And um, it just started because I had, like, an indoor soccer team, and we, like, wanted to, like, invite our friends to it. And so we weren't at all, at all deliberate about what we were trying to build. We weren't deliberate about the mission of the company, the culture of the company. Um, we just wanted to build something. We were like two computer scientists, but like the most exciting thing to do is to start a company. Let's go start a company. Um, and so I think the, you know, the biggest thing that we did in terms of this time, so um, we started the company a year ago. And the very first thing we did on the first day was on a whiteboard list out what was the type of company we wanted to build. Both what did we as individuals want to learn and what did we want our culture to be. Um, and then the second thing is, is we were going to come up with ideas, prototype them quickly, and get a ton of consumer validation. Um, so that big differential of really thinking about upfront what you, not only what is the company you want, but what is the mission and product you want to deliver to the market? Um, so I think that was one of the biggest kind of both things we did the first time that we really changed how we approached the business the second time. I want to talk about raising money. Sure. What was, the, what was the most surprising thing to you when you first started to raise money? And were you and your co-founder treated differently at all by investors? So obviously you've done this twice. Um, one, when um, it was the dot-com bubble, which many of you probably don't remember, but, um, but you were basically raising money to get eyeballs. You're like, how many people can we get to see our site? Um, and so, you know, we raised $37 million for online invitations. And, like, that just sounds crazy. Um, and it was crazy. It was, like, far, far too much capital for what you needed to do to build a business. Um, so this time, when we went to go raise money, we were a lot more thoughtful about how much do we want to raise, what do we want to use the capital for, um, and we were a lot more thoughtful about who we wanted to partner with, and that kind of goes back to, to what you were saying in terms of like when you went to go raise, you know, what the experience was like. So my co-founder, um, just to, we did Evite together, and then we didn't work together for 15 years. Um, and in between, we had a lot of different experiences. But he had started a company and raised $80 million for a company called ClearSlide. Um, and I hadn't raised money. Um, but we made the decision that I was going to be the CEO of the company, um, because one of the things I wanted to learn was how do I fundraise. Um, and so we were, you know, he said, this is your job. I'll, you know, you have to do it. And it was, you know, and. It was a very different experience because I was walking in with a lot of people that I had known in the Valley. Um, but the biggest thing when we were looking for a partner was we wanted to find someone who believed in what we were doing. And we got a lot of people that said, I really like you guys. You guys are both serial entrepreneurs. We want to invest in you. But we think the fitness space is too crowded. And so we, you know, Al looked at me with a lot of conviction and said, we believe in our product. We believe we've built something different. This is a live experience that's bringing in great music. It's bringing in coaches and accountability. It's bringing in engaged community. I, we will, let's not go to a fundraising meeting until we actually have people try the product. Um, so we sent this crazy note to a bunch of people, and Al's like, 
you know, you don't need to send it to so many. I'm like, people aren't going to like go outside and exercise for us to have a fundraising conversation. And we ended up like s sending the investors that we weren't going to have a fundraising conversation until they actually tried the product. And the funny thing was, we ended up with these VCs literally racing against each other. So it was supposed to be this like very encouraging experience of like the coach is supporting you along and you're walking. Um, and meanwhile, the very next day, one of their admins calls me and says like, my boss can't walk and it's totally your fault. And I was like, but, uh, but we, we had, I think the thing is, is through that, what we were doing is we were trying to make sure people believed in the mission and the vision of the company. Like our vision is to change activity rates for people by creating social engaging fitness experiences like we want to improve health and wellness and we wanted people that were passionate about what we were doing and then we wanted to bring what expertise we had to the table um, and so we ended up taking our um, capital from Greylock and from Reid Hoffman um, and you know he never treated me differently than any than my co-founder so I didn't have that experience with most of the people that we went to and we didn't go to anybody that had a bad reputation, like as far as treating women badly. There were multiple people where I told Al, I said, I'm just not gonna go to them. Like we're not even gonna engage them in the process. So that, I love that it's a personal story, but it's pretty specific to what you guys are building. Do you have any more general advice for other women who might wanna start a company, wanna seek investment, but perhaps feel a little intimidated by the process? Absolutely, so I think that it is coming down to finding somebody that is bringing both expertise to the table and what you're doing, as well as somebody that you do believe is somebody that you can partner with for the long term. And, you know, it is harder, like, because all of the data shows it. There's less women that get funded. There was a most recent research study that had a very interesting data in it that showed even how women get asked questions, that women are asked questions like, so... Um, how do you expect to fail versus how do you expect to succeed, right? So a lot of it is you walking in with that confidence um, to say, this is, like, how am I going to fail? Well, this is how I'm going to succeed, right? So you have to walk in being very well prepped. And, you know, that's the same when, you know, if we talk about board interviewing, um, I bombed my first board interview because, you know, I didn't walk in prepped in terms of when, um, you're going to go talk to people. And so you having that confidence of your story and your business and then practicing. I practiced with Emily Melton, who you mentioned. Um, I went and I pitched and I practiced with three, uh, three other people in the industry and said, what are, my, what are the questions I'm going to be getting asked? What am I doing wrong? How do I improve? And that was kind of what Bridget said, which is go out and ask for help. Um, so to me, it's one is have confidence in what you're doing. Go out and try to find those VCs that you think or those seed funders that you think have good reputations, whether that's we also put Aileen Lee from Cowboy Ventures on our cap table because I wanted a female on the cap table. Um, but it's going and figuring out how am I getting myself prepared? How am I making sure I am doing diligence on them that they're actually good people and that they're people that are going to support you along the road? So it's when you're choosing an investor, it's must about you choosing them and them choosing you. And then, um, and then the third thing is really making sure that you're walking in with that confidence of your communication. So it's kind of hard to have a conversation about women in work without talking about current events. Sure. There are so many women who are coming out with these stories of being mistreated in the technology industry. And as a woman who's been in this space for so long, do you think things are changing? Are we just talking about it more? Like, what, what's the status of women, and how has it changed over that time? So, I mean, uh, yeah, showing my age, I mean, I have been in the technology industry for two decades at this point. You started right out of <laughs> <laughs> So, and, you know, the thing is, is there aren't, um, you know, there aren't, the numbers are there. Like, the women aren't in the industry. You keep having, you know, you'll have stories or things that happen to you all the time. I, I was, for four years, was running um, a European Ticketmaster um, on the product and engineering side, and we did a lot of acquisitions. And I would walk in, and the guy who would come do diligence with me was this like middle-aged white guy, and everybody always naturally assumed that he was my boss. And so they'd be like, "Sir, can we buy get you some coffee? Sir, can we do this?" And we literally had a bet of how many minutes it would take till they realized that was his boss. And so, I mean, 
like, and, and it was always that look of, oh my God, she's making the decision and we've been treating her like the secretary. And, um, and so, you know, you have all those stories and that has been true since the dawn of like, since I've been in the industry where people just have always made the assumption that, you know, I'm either the business person or the marketing person or the secretary. Um, and so I, I think that that has been there. Um, I think that, you know, if you think about sexual harassment, my assumption has been that that has also been there. If you think about any industry, Wall Street manufacturing, sexual harassment is a problem. Part of what has happened in tech is that people were claiming it was better. There was this meme that tech is a meritocracy and it's all about, you know, what you can do. But that's actually not factually true. There is bias in the industry. There's harassment in the industry. And so I am... You know, as an engineer, as Bridget said, like, I'm kind of, I'm very happy that the problem is getting exposed because unless you can expose a problem and unless you discuss a problem, there's no way to come up with tools to fix it. Um, but do I think that it's gotten worse? No. Do I think that it's always been there? Absolutely. And I would say that that thing, you know, and even Bridget used the term lucky, I was lucky. Well, I would argue she was hardworking and smart and that she figured out who she wanted to work with and, um, and was making deliberate decisions about putting herself in positions to succeed. And women always say, we're lucky. Men always say, I, I, I crushed it. And so it's also the dialogue of like how we as women um, you know, think about our own decisions, how we as women, so I, I'm, the industry has to change, but I also think it is that confidence in I can raise the money, I can start the company, I can, you know, be in a place where I can succeed, whether, and so, I mean, it is on the industry, it's on obviously men, and it's on also women. Sure. You talked about bias. How do you train the people who work for you who are in manager roles to interview women? So I believe very strongly, and this goes back to a little bit of what I was saying, that it's very important in your companies and wherever you're working that you try to do as much behavioral interviewing as possible. And what I mean by that is women will always downplay stuff that they have done, and men will always say that, you know, oh, yeah, like, it's the, I, it. I did it, <laughs> I was amazing. And women will always say, we got this project done. And so the, the way that you get around that is ensuring in your companies that you are, when you're, in, when you're on interview panels, when you're um, involved in those, is, is saying, how would you approach this problem? Giving people case studies is a much more fair way to interview that shows how people will walk through a real scenario, um, rather than saying, oh, I see, you know, you grew the business from five million to eight million, or you coded this project, what did you contribute? Um, so I think that's really important. The second is just making sure that you that you are on interview panels for other people, for because women fundamentally want to see that there's women at other companies, and that makes a difference in hiring as well. So being proactive in your own companies of saying how can I help make sure this is a place that is supportive of women is important. Why did you leave SurveyMonkey to start another company? <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, so I was at SurveyMonkey for six and a half years. For five and a half years, um, I was in an absolutely great environment. I um, worked for a gentleman named Dave Goldberg, um, who was just fantastic. Um, unfortunately, he suddenly passed away in May of 2015, um, and the environment changed. Um, so that was like a big factor. But for me, every single year, every January, I sit down and I write down three things on a piece of paper. Am I working on a product I'm loving? And like, what is that I want to be doing? Are the people I'm working with amazing and people, people that I want to keep working with? And the third thing is, what do I want to explicitly learn this year? Um, and writing, being proactive about what you actually want to learn makes you, forces you to make decisions. And I realized in um, January of 2016 that I wasn't going to learn at SurveyMonkey what I wanted to learn. Um, and when I started to think about what I wanted to learn, I was like, I want to run my own company. Um, and I want to like solve a problem using technology. And then the second thing is, because Dave passed, um, I was very passionate about how could I think about health and wellness. How could I have made, you know, I thought about all the times we were sitting there, you know, eating protein bars in the conference room, and it's like, what if we had just gone on a walk? Like, how can you make activity? It has a, 
you know, 22 minutes a day of activity leads to a 31% reduction in a 14-year fatality rate. So how can I help get people moving? So it was a product I knew I wanted to build. It was a co-founder whom I adore and who I knew we would work well with. And it was where I knew I was going to learn a ton. I'm learning about mobile. I'm learning about being the CEO. I'm learning about fundraising. Um, and there's just tons. I know that Dave was a really special mentor to you. And you know, even as a woman in my own career, like, I understand the impulse to gravitate toward a female mentor because it's that feeling of like, well, they know exactly what it's going to be like or what it feels like to be in this position. But I, my mentor is a man too and is doing a fantastic job. And I am curious if there's anything that you, any advice from your relationship with Dave that you could share that maybe somebody who's early in their career could learn from? Sure. I'd say having mentors is very important. Um, having mentors that are very generic where you're like, I want you to be my mentor, that just doesn't work. Um, so you have to be in a position where if you have a mentor, you are having an explicit discussion with them about something specific. So whether it is, look, I am you know, dealing with this specific management issue and I'm coming to you with question A, B, and C. Or, like, I'm trying to decide in my career whether to stay as an engineer or move into, my man into management, and I want to specifically talk about that. Um, the thing is with mentors is there's right mentors for different times. Um, and I've had many, many mentors in my career. There's times where, you know, I needed somebody who was going to help me, you know, become better at communicating. Like, that's going to be somebody different, whether it's within your company, it's a peer, somebody who works for you. It doesn't need to be that a mentor is necessarily somebody who's this extremely senior person. You have to think about what am I trying to get mentorship on? And what is that explicit question? And who can help f fit that sort of mentor role at this time? And so even nowadays, when people like reach out and they're like, I, you know, I, I'm looking for a mentor, I'm like, that's not a useful thing. Like, <laughs> you know, come talk to me about something specific that I can help you with. Because I can always find 15 minutes to jump on a call and help you with a specific question. Um, and that's true with a lot of people. And that is where you start to realize and build those mentor relationships over time, um, where then you, you, you start feeling like somebody knows you and you know them. Um, and it just happened with Dave that he was also my boss. But that doesn't always have to be true. Great. So do you have any strategy for building a more diverse team now that you're starting from the ground up again? Yeah, so I mean, both. At, at the ground up, as well as at SurveyMonkey, I mean, we took that from, I joined when we were 18 people and had a team of 300 over the five and a half years. And um, so one of the things that Bridget touched on, which I think is vitally important, is not dismissing people who don't necessarily have the traditional background. So we also did a lot in terms of driving boot camps. Um, she covered that, uh, covered sort of the early stage. Um, you know. The second piece of a diversity, so one, if you think about the problem set, there's one problem which is what is referred to as the pipeline problem, right? There's not enough people that are coming into the field. The second problem is that women aren't getting promoted at the same levels as other men. And when you look at all of the qualitative data about what people feel about women managers in technology, it's that they're quote unquote not technical. And so the question is, how can you in your, whether it's your organization or you specifically, continue to make sure that you are, um, ha that you are you know, essentially presenting yourself to your peers and your bosses and everything is technical. And so that is giving speaking opportunities within your organization to women and men equally. So we used to do tech talks. It's like, how do I make sure that that's gender balanced? You know, if you look at whether it's PyCon or F8 or any of those, the speakers are definitely not 50-50. So it's how do we try to make sure that there is more women in the tech conferences, there's more women in the technical discussions, and making sure that you, even as your manager, continuing to um, focus on also that, that the, the bias that exists that people will view you as less technical based on your gender. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we are trying to do is how do I make sure that women are getting um, that sort of equal um, exposure um, as being technologists. And so that's specifically around diversity on women in technology. 
And then on the board side, I do think that that's a much harder problem. You know, um, Sukinder Cassidy has done a great job starting board lists to at least stop the the meme that like there's not enough women out there. It's like okay, there's actually quite a bit of women out there. It's like, um, but it's still getting through that. Um, the thing where most of the guys in the nominating committee are still a bunch of white men. And so how do you start changing that? It's a much harder problem. And I'm, I you know, wouldn't stand up here and say I have any answers. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only person here who has questions for you. So maybe we should open it up to audience Q&A. Anybody? Um, I'm gonna have a question. All right, well, you guys think about your questions and I'll, I'll ask another one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there any really common mistake that you see women making in the office or in the workspace that you wish you could just, you know, so, pull them aside and say, don't do that? Yeah, for sure. So I think that one of the biggest things is this not willing to take that, take that risk and speak up um, and take that risk and, and be in the room and sort of ask that question. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I had a very senior executive on my team and I said to her, I said, you have to, you're very bright and you're, you have all this information, but you're unwilling to express your opinion in rooms. And she said, no one's ever told me that. Um, and so I think the thing is, is that there's a lot of women conferences, con there's a lot of conferences or a lot of discussions around, there's not enough women in the industry, but women gain confidence from knowledge. And so whether it's understanding the metrics and data in your company, whether it is, um, like one of the things that we tried to start was this like, you know, rather than having women's groups or women are sitting around like chatting about the problem, it's having one person present, whether they're the marketing executive, this is what like cost per click means, this is what cost per acquisition means, having our head of growth present the metrics to different women. And so the question is how do you both um, kind of give other women in your circle that confidence about how things are operating as well as um, encourage people. If you see that person sitting next to you isn't talking, is saying, hey, like, why don't you add something to the conversation? Um, you know, I think that as a, as, a, as a group, you know, we should help each other and be, you know, pushing each other to be better. And that does mean that, you know, you have that responsibility when you see somebody not speaking up, you see somebody not participating is asking for their opinion. And I do feel that that's one of the things is that, you know, it, all the data shows that women need more um, like encouraging and confidence to actually speak out, but there is a huge value to that. There's a huge, like people walk out of the room and say, oh yeah, like that person was on it. Um, and there is there is a value to that in, in a setting. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions? And okay, now there's some questions. I was like, oh. <laughs> Sorry. So we picked no, it's fine. <laughs> Hello. Hi, um, I'm Dawn with Alaska Airlines. Hey, um, I'm wondering about ageism. So I think I'm about the same age as you, and I, I'm a software developer, and it was enough in my 20s to have to deal with all this stuff, but now I'm old and a woman. So um, what advice would you give me as far as keeping on top and not letting the program or stereotype um, kind of intimidate me? I mean, you have like decades more experience than those people in like life, which is like seeing things like, you know, just in the sense of like understanding perspectives on like what is important and what's not important. Um, and just in terms of the fact that like just having seen so much, like you probably, you're, you have to realize you're probably two X faster at any problem. And so, I mean, I think the fact is, is that like people, there's definitely no question there's ageism in the industry. Um, but I would say is keeping that confidence knowing that you do have a lot of experience and you know, ex experience shouldn't be like underappreciated. And so, I mean, again, it's a lot of that is, is as, you as you tell people, it's like, oh yeah, I saw this three years ago or 10 years ago and people made the same mistake. Like, don't be afraid to call that out because like, again, it's like, it's trying to teach people around you that experience matters, and it does matter. Like, it would be silly to say it didn't. Okay, we're going to do, do questions over here, and then I'll make my way to that side of the room. Hi, my name's Hi. Uh, Carolyn Tierney, and I'm significantly older than both of you. <laughs> um, 
I've been in the recruiting business for technology for 30 plus years in the Northwest. And you should be up here. I have recruited <laughs> a lot of people, and I've learned a lot about what kind of people fit and what don't. And what concerns me, one thing about what you say, this idea that they're not technical enough. Exactly. If every leader in technology has to have been a coder, that's a problem. I think it's great that you are, and the pre previous speaker was, but. That right there, there are different kinds of brains, and they're not all wired to do the same thing. So what happens is that the opportunity gets shrunk even more. So now you got to not just be a woman in technology; you got to be a female coder. Well, men don't have to be coders when they. So, to, so to be fair, there's very few engineering leaders who are not coders. If you think about product, you think about design, you think about marketers. Um, and those functions, there are often people, both males and females, that are not coders. The, the research I was talking about in terms of women not being viewed as technical and the loss of promoting was specifically in the engineering function, and I should have been more explicit about that. Um, you're absolutely right, and I'm very glad you cleared that up. Um, but that, and, and when you say technical, it's not necessarily also, and the research was on the engineering side, but Technical broadly is like that they're, are they as skilled, right? So do you have the skills for like, are you a great designer? Are you a great product person? Um, and so it's women's skills get questioned more as well. And so it's making sure that you're out there communicating, you know, the fact that you're an expert in what you do and not just a good people manager. But you're absolutely right that I strongly do not think that people um, in other you know, areas that are still women in tech necessarily have to have an engineering degree. Right. People down here are more technical and more smart, and th but they have poor communication skills. And these people that you know are further away from the machine get more and more social and able to talk and hold a conversation. So I think that there's that I've seen it over the years that there really is like a I don't know some kind of a stratification of you know. And there's very few people that are close to the machine. Absolutely. And the, the, the further away from the machine you get, the bigger, the broader the opportunity. And there's no question that, you know, having the social skill set, women have, again, from a research perspective, women are more empathetic. I mean, those are things that are very, very positive skills in management, right? Like, it, you know, having, there's no reason why we shouldn't use the skills that we have to our advantage as well in terms of, like, not, you know, often being better with people, being more empathetic. Um, so that's also a huge positive that you can take to your advantage. There's a question up front. And then she has one too in the orange sweater. Hi, Hi, I'm Jasmine Gibson. My question for you today actually follows on the last question a little bit. For those women that are technical who want to move into management, yeah. there are definitely some challenges with that. Even anyone in particular moving from being a technical role to management, do you have some suggestions on overcoming challenges? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that moving into manager, first of all, you shouldn't, you should set it up with the mindset that this is something that I'm going to give a try, and you should never feel bad if it's not something that you enjoy. So that's like the first thing I always tell people, which is, um, which is, you know, management is a very different skill, it's a very different level of enjoyment. Like you, if you're managing five people, you're influencing 20% of five things versus like 100% of one thing. And so you have to take real enjoyment out of that. Um, and so the first thing is, is I feel like is that if you're given the opportunity and you have an inkling to try, don't take it as, you know, if I don't like it, I have to stick with it. There's very, very strong paths to succeed that are like pure technical paths. So that's like the first thing. Um, the second thing is, is that 
I love management. Like I get this massive satisfaction over watching other people succeed, watching, helping other people to succeed. And you think about the most important thing about being a manager. I always say the most important thing is, is seeing how can I help you? Like what are the blockers you're facing as an individual and how can I help you succeed? So that's the first thing. The second thing is always ask, especially as a new manager, always ask people for feedback. Even when I was managing 300 people, I would do a quarterly survey every quarter with how are we doing, how am I doing. Um, every new start after three to six months, I'd take them out to lunch and say, what are we doing well at this company? What can we do better? So like that, that cycle, obviously we're working at SurveyMonkey, so we're getting a lot of feedback. But, like, <laughs> but, but just in general, even at our small company, I'm like sending out an employee satisfaction survey for our like, you know, a dozen people. Um, but, it's, but it's that thing which is like you can't get better without understanding where you can get better. And I feel like a lot of new managers are really afraid to ask people, you know, you know, how's it going for you? How can I be better? Um, and so when I was an early manager, and even for a pretty long, I used to always, at the end of every one-on-one, -on -one, I would say, how can I help you? Is there anything I could be doing better? And so, I mean, so it's both, to me, it's like really trying to make sure that you're getting rid of the blockers for them and that you are constantly, as, as Bridget said well, in the continuous improvement. Is that helpful? Okay, we've got a question over here. Let's do this one first and then we can do yours. Hi, I'd love Hi. to hear you talk a little bit about that mindset of, um, you know, a lot of women, they're comfortable taking the student loan, the car loan, the mortgage, but then going and asking for $37 million. <laughs> and, you know, I know that Evite was a success, but maybe if you've mentored some people who've, you know, took that money and it wasn't, and then now what you're going after sure. now and just taking that leap. And, and let's With be no clear, words. Evite was not an in, uh, ROI success for our investors. The dot-com bubble burst, um, and we put ourselves out for bid in the Wall Street Journal and sold to um, IAC Interactive Corp. Um, and so we did not get the return for our investors that you know, they wanted. It was a brand success and a product success, but not necessarily an investment success. Um, and that's OK. Like, investors invest in a lot of companies um, that don't that don't give them that return. Like they are expecting in their portfolio of investments that a percentage will succeed and make back their fund, and it, it's like part of that risk is is theirs to take, right? So don't, from my perspective, if first of all, like you should not like they are making a bet. Um, and you have a responsibility to your employees, you have a responsibility to your investors to like work as hard as you can and like try to solve the problems as hard as you can, but ultimately like they are making the investment decision. Um, and so you sh like from my perspective, if you fail, it's not like you can't, or you, it wasn't a smashing success, it's not that you can't go back. It shouldn't be that like if this one idea doesn't work and I go and I raise money, you have to be responsible with other people's capital but you can still, if you have a new idea that you think is good, you can still go back. So I just wanted to like um, set that stage. And then, sorry, your second part was just about? It's, it's just that mindset of taking the leap of going to something that you know, it was really that. It was really interesting. I was speaking at, um, with my friend, Amy Chang, who's amazing. She has a company called A Company. Um, but she said, we were at this like, Stanford Business School Women Entrepreneurs Group. And she said, OK, so how many of you want to start a company? Raise your hand. And um, like two people raised their hand, raised their hands. So she said to everyone else, start telling me why you won't, don't want to raise, why you wouldn't go start a company. Um, and I think that's the right mindset, which is like, you know, why are you not going to try it if you have an idea? I mean, obviously, the thing has to be that you're really excited and passionate about your idea, because you're going to be waking up in the morning and thinking about it like, I mean, in the middle of the night, you know, um, you're having dreams of like, oh, this could be a new onboarding, you know, to get more people to try my product. Like, so you are going to be like fully invested. So like, that's the thing. I mean, my kids still come first, but like, you're still going to be fully invested in your product. So like, but if you have that idea, it's like, and then ideally you find somebody that you can partner with because it is a, it is a lot of ups and downs and like, oh, um, and so I think that would be the second thing. But then I think that the piece of like, why not try it? Like, it is so fun. Your learning pace is so fast. Like, 
And there is a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of dumb money out there. You don't have to take it from a good person necessarily. Like if you can find it, like take it, you know? Like if you can find it from a great person, great. But there's also just a lot of money floating out there, you know? So, I mean, that, I, I'm kind of in the mindset of like, if there's something you're excited about, I mean, do the research. Like make sure that if it's a consumer product, you have a lot of, con you know, you're getting. We both did quantitative research and asked a bunch of consumers. We ourselves went to like, un totally unfit Selena, went to like SoulCycle to be like, why is this one working, you know? <laughs> and then like, and then we also, you know, pro prototyped something, recruited random users off Facebook to try a prototype. I mean, validate your idea, but if you have done the work to like validate your idea, there's zero reason why you shouldn't take the risk to go do it. And people are always like, oh, I'm, you know, I've heard the, you know, I'm going to be a mom or um, I'm trying to, you know, like these other things in my life. And it's like, I kind of, I have the view, which is like, you know, you get really good at prioritizing and you are going to, there's no, if you set the right boundaries, like on anything, you can be successful. And so there is zero reason not to go do your own startup. It is so fun. <laughs> I, I, hopefully I'm not saying that to a bunch of Redfin employees. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Glenn getting mad at me in the front seat. But <laughs> question, oh, I see a question. Do you want to go first, or do you want us to go first? We have time. Hello. Oh, I can go first. Go ahead. Hi, Selena. Hi. Thank you for um, you know the information today. My name is Mindy, and my question for you is: um, Looking back at your two decades in the tech industry and also starting your companies, um, what are some aha moments and some oh, I wish I know then what I know now? Sure. So I'd say in terms of like one of the biggest aha moments I've had is just the fact that understanding, and this is going to sound very pedantic, but understanding like the data, whether it's the metrics of your business, like how to run A-B tests. Like I truly believe when we did, even did Evite 20 years ago, there was invite me to, see you there, um, time dance, like you name it, there was another. And Evite was the only one that, even though like it wasn't necessarily a massively ROI success for our investors, was the only one that got bought and had a brand. And that was because we were constantly A-B testing. Um, we had, you know, at the time, it was like a little link that said, do you want to see your name here? We had, like, tested tons of different flows. And the thing is, is, and then when I got later in my career, it was like being, a, you know, again, starting off as a technologist, but understanding the business data, understanding what would drive the business forward um, was something that was really important. And so I think the thing for me, um, some of the biggest sort of like aha moments I've had is like if you kind of understand the fundamentals and you take that time to do that in the business, even as an engineer, it really helps as you're thinking about anything, whether it's how should I develop this product, how should I code it. Um, and so I think that's been sort of one of the biggest aha moments I've had. Um, I would say as far as like, you know, when I look back, um, there's a couple things like on the management side, um, if you're an early manager, I took a, too long to let go of bad people. And that may sound like strange advice, but when you're in your first job as a manager, it's very hard to like be like, this person sucks, and like, I need to do something about it. Like, that's a very hard emotion. Um, and you're like, is it me? Like, is it, you know? And so I think, you know, obviously making sure that you are, you know, having that good feedback with them and you're giving them that right feedback, but waiting too, too long to let go of bad people is something that I think I really struggled with early in my career. Um, and then I would say that, um, that the other thing was is that when I was early in my career, I also lacked a lot of patience. Um, and so also trying to think of like, okay, like how can I think about, like Bridget was saying, how can I think about this problem from somebody else's perspective? Um, so those would be some of the biggest both like aha moments and mistakes. I don't know if that's helpful. Okay, one more up front and then one back here and then we'll take a break. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yovana Evans. I'm with Liberty Mutual. And I just wanted to ask you a question. So um, I'm sorry? Liberty. Oh, no. Liberty. Liberty. Not, okay, <laughs> not the bank. Company. Okay, the insurance, <laughs> not Liberty, the, yep. the who own eBay. I mean, a technology company that sells insurance is what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so, so many of uh, just general conversations around diversity focus a lot on sort of us versus them and men and women. But I'm just curious, I mean, there are so many ways in which we as women can do a better job at supporting other women. Right. So I'm curious if you could maybe speak to just a few ways in which we could avoid some of the pitfalls and, and be better champions for other, other women around us. Yeah, absolutely. And I talked about it a little bit. Like the first to me is encouraging other women. So if you see a woman who you think should apply for that management position is like, you know, saying to them, you know, you can never guarantee somebody gets it, but it's like, hey, you should consider this. If it's somebody where you see that you know that the other woman has something interesting to say, but is like a little bit more cautious is calling them out and being like, hey, you know, um, and like, what do you think about this topic? Like, it is doing that encouragement. And like I said, I really think it is also sharing knowledge. So it is spending the time. If you're the expert in product or you're the expert in design, like, share. Like, what are the stuff that works? How do you get more users to convert? Like, the, it is that thing of, you know, there is that old boys network and it does exist. Like, there's no reason there shouldn't be, you know, the old girls network. Hi, my question is, um, what is your advice on how to find the right advisor for your baby company? For your company? Yeah. How so do you... I think it's, it's looking at, um, so it depends what you're trying to do. So there's like space, right? So there's like consumer and enterprise. And then there's also like what expertise are you actually looking for to balance what you, what you haven't done? So for us, as an example, I'd never done mobile and, and for fitness, for Gixo to succeed, we need to have a very engaged networker community. So I was trying to find somebody who, um, who had that experience with building like a network, you know, which obviously, you know, Reed Hoffman built LinkedIn. And then looking at Aileen, like she brings a lot of expertise to the table around sort of the marketing and the branding side, which I also had no experience in. So it's figuring out what are you looking for advice in? What companies have they been involved in, either as an operator or an investor? And like being, again, being just very deliberate about going and approaching people mm -hmm. and, and asking people for specific questions. And over time, you can figure out if that's the right advisor. Like, don't start off and be like, I want you to be my advisor, because you could really regret that. But like, start off with, hey, I'm looking for advice on this topic. And like, if that goes well, then it's like, hey, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, I'm looking for advice on this topic. Um, and you start figuring out if that's somebody you want as like a long-term advisor in your, in your company. OK, thank you. And keep your advisor agreements to a year, so that if you end up realizing it's not a good fit, it's easier to shuck them off. <laughs> 